Good evening. My name is Chloe, and I'm a member of the TIFF Next Wave Committee, a group of 12 teenagers responsible for organizing a series of youth-oriented events at TIFF Bell Lightbox year-round, including the TIFF Next Wave Film Festival. Thank you. As a kickoff to this year's Next Wave Festival, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this evening's In Conversation with Amanda Stenberg. To begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, we would like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Toronto. The TIFF Next Wave Committee is supported by the Slate Family Foundation Learning Fund. And of course, thank you to our members and our donors for their generous contributions to TIFF and to those who support TIFF's learning programs year round. And let's also give a shout out to our media partner for TIFF Next Wave, Vice. We are so excited to have Amenla Stenberg here with us this evening. She is so inspiring to us as film lovers and creators, as someone who uses their platform to engage in important cultural conversations and lives unapologetically as their truest self. We are thrilled to have Amanda Paris moderating this evening's conversation with Amanda. Before we begin the talk, I'll introduce our host. Amanda Paris is an educator, actor, and playwright. She is the host of The Exhibitionist, CBC Arts' weekly TV and online series, and CBC, Two's Radio, uh, CBC Radio 2's Marvin's Room. Her plays have been staged at numerous theatre festivals around Canada and internationally. She is the co-founder of the alternative education organization Lost Lyrics, and she created the Ride or Die Project, a multi-platform initiative that produces creative content inspired by women supporting loved ones who are incarcerated. She is also a weekly columnist for CBC Arts. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Amanda Paris. to be here. I'm so excited to be here with all of you this evening. I heard that this crowd is really hype. I hope you guys are not going to disappoint. Yeah? Pretty hype? Okay, good, good, good. Um, I'm a huge fan of Amanda Lestenberg. I actually didn't tell her this, but there was a period in time when I used to teach Lost Lyrics and I, we used to tell the kids, you should come up with like a street name, like a hip hop name, kind of like a pseudonym. So you know when you go into the rap battles, you don't come out as like Doug. You can come out as something a little cooler. Um, and they were like, well, what's your street name? And I actually chose it to be a mandala because I had studied about the anti-apartheid movement and I knew that that word meant power to, like power to the people, and it was part of their slogans of freedom. And I loved that name. And so it's kind of cool that a person who was actually born with that name is somebody that I get to talk to with all of you this evening. So I'm going to introduce her. I'll also let you know how this evening's gonna go. I'm gonna talk to her for a little bit. We're gonna have a bit of a conversation. We'll watch some movie clips, and then we're gonna open it up to all of you so you can have your questions. So prepare them as me and her are talking. Let us know what you wanna know. We're gonna have 20 five minutes so it's a nice full rich amount of time to ask some questions cool okay great so Amanda Stenberg has had a meteoric rise since she began acting as a young girl and has become one of the most influential emerging creators and activists of her generation after appearing in Colombiana in Colombiana um, as the young in Colombiana as it says Rosario Dawson but it wasn't Rosario Dawson it was Zoe Saldana, as Zoe Saldana's character's younger self. I was like, hmm, that doesn't seem like the right Latin. Okay. Um, at age 12, she found success in the blockbuster franchise The Hunger Games in 2012. She's continued her acting career in powerful independent films like As You Are, Everything, Everything, and the highly anticipated The Hate You Give based on Angie Thomas's book of the same name. She's, yeah, that deserves a woo. That's a good book. She's a tireless advocate for representation in the film industry and beyond and continues to create boundary pushing work on essential initiatives such as the Art Ho Collective, which you should follow on Instagram, which aims to create space for queer POC artists. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Amanda Stenberg. So 
So this is your. Her, this is also her first time to Toronto. So we gotta represent, guys. Like we gotta let her know. Okay. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna just jump right into it. Is that cool? Yeah. 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 Okay. It. Tell me, when did you realize that you wanted to be an actor? Um. Really, really early on. I don't know if I can actually remember personally, but my mom tells me that when I was about three or four years old, I told her that that's what I wanted to be. Okay. And were there, I know for some of us, there are movies and television shows that kind of shape the reason why we want to get into this world. Were there movies and TVs that are part of your personal canon that helped inspire you to want to get into the movies or get into film and television? Or yeah, film? yeah, absolutely. Um, My mom exposed me to, I mean, I actually watched a lot of like really old um, movies and TV when I was younger. My mom would put on TV Land a lot. Okay. And so I'd be watching kind of classic stuff like I Love Lucy and like that sort of stuff. But I was also inspired by like Boys in the Hood, like movies that... You weren't watching that at three and four. I wasn't watching okay, that at three right. and four. <laughs> that's kind of like I'm jumping forward to okay. maybe like 12. <laughs> wow, that's still good. I'm still, <laughs> still young for that. Um, but, but yeah, there, there's all kinds of things that have inspired me, I think. Probably what inspired me most as a creator was Do the Right Thing. Mm. That's a film that I check in on like every so often just mm -hmm. to kind of remind me what I feel like film is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, for many of us, it's seen the example of having someone that's doing something that we can now envision ourselves to do that reveals uh, an opportunity. Uh, something that we can now see as a possibility for our own lives. Are there any actors or artists that you saw who told you that this was something that you could do? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I feel really lucky to have grown up with people in the media like Oprah or Beyonce. Mm -hmm. and I don't think I would have believed in myself had I not had those people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I think I know for myself when I was growing up, um, I was born around, I think it was either the year of or the year after Oprah's show began. Mm -hmm. And so my mom was on mat leave um, and she kind of noticed that the show was on and would watch it every single day and would tell me, that's your Auntie Oprah. So for my whole <laughs> life, I referred to her as that's Auntie tight. Oprah. And yeah. I didn't understand why Auntie Oprah never came over for Christmas. And later on, I realized <laughs> she didn't literally mean. But yeah, no, seeing her on screen for my entire life is hugely transformative. Mm -hmm. and, Very similar for Beyonce, seeing her for so much of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I read that you repeatedly called the casting agent of The Hunger Games because you were so determined to get the part. <laughs> uh, can you tell me what drew you to this film and compelled you to go to this audition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did my first movie when I was about 10 years old. And that was a role that was really challenging to find. And, and especially at that age, it was nearly impossible for me to find roles for young black girls that I thought were nuanced and compelling and interesting, or even just that existed that wasn't just like ghetto girl. Like, right, <laughs> you yeah. know, those were kind of the only roles that were being sent to me. Um, and so when I read The Hunger Games, I, I, I was a huge fan of the book, like read it like five times, <laughs> like huge nerd. And I, I was amazed that there was a character that existed that was pivotal to the storyline and, and pivotal to the eventual kind of meaning of the whole series mm -hmm. um, that was described in the book as having satiny brown skin. Mm. I was like, what? Yeah. For real? Like, yeah. So as soon as I read that um, and I knew they were making a movie, I was like, this is, a, this is one of the only roles that exists for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I pursued it with my entire heart, also just because I was a huge fan of the series. And, And I pursued it so much that I, I got it. <laughs> I think they, they also gave me some tips that helped. Like they told me when I got the call back to dress up in the part. So I like rolled around in mud. I was wearing like <laughs> camo, like I rolled around in mud. I put twigs in my hair. And then I got to the call back and it was happening at the director's house. Um, <laughs> he has like the very, door. <laughs> very nice suede furniture. <laughs> Like, it was, like, very nice carpet, and I was just, like, tracking mud everywhere. Like, oh, my God. I was, like, super embarrassed, but they really loved it, and they loved my enthusiasm for it. That's awesome. So let's watch a clip from The Hunger Games. Oh, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you want mine, too? No, that's okay. Here. Thanks. How long was I asleep? 
couple of days. I changed your leaves twice. Thank you. So what happened while I was out? The girl from one and the boy from ten. And the, uh, and the boy from my district? Yeah, he's okay. I think he's down by the river. Is all of that true? What? You and him. <laughs> so where are Cato and the others? They got all their supplies down by the lake. It's piled up in this great big pyramid. That sounds tempting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> not watched that in so long. How does it feel watching that again? It's really trippy. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's really strange. Well, it's it's really nice because I feel like that kind of propelled me towards being able to do all the things that mm -hmm. I get to do now. So I feel really grateful. Mm -hmm. um, so you were 12 years old when you did this film, mm -hmm. and when they announced the casting, there was a lot of controversy with some fans that didn't mm -hmm. catch that line in the book. They didn't catch the satin. They didn't catch brown the satin skin. brown skin line, and they were upset <laughs> that a young black woman or young black girl had been cast in this role. Mm -hmm. um, at 12, did you understand what was happening in terms of that controversy? Yeah, 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 of course. Well, I mean, I feel like by 12, most black kids already have experienced racism and understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really let it get to me. I mean, I, it wasn't shocking to me. Mm -hmm. I had already experienced just not being able to find roles for myself right. um, or always getting the note, like, we're going in a different direction. Uh, so at that point in time, I, I kind of had already built a, a thicker skin mm -hmm. when it came to that sort of treatment. So it it upset me. I remember it upsetting me. But then I remember thinking that everyone was dumb because it was in the book. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the character of Rue is such. Her storyline is so compelling, and it has moved so many people and so. Uh, so many fans. I mean, I think I there was actually I was at a bar. I think this was like a year ago, and they were silently playing the movie. I don't know why they would decide to play the Hunger Games silently. Silently. In the bar. I was just like, okay, was there this music is, playing too? Or yeah. Just... So this is like what they chose to put up as a visual. And then what like was the music? Is... Like I'm just curious what. Um, I since I was at the bar, I'm assuming it was hip hop. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. Since I spent time, and then like you know, this is a kind of traumatic movie, right? Yeah. Like it's not really casual watching. Like light fair. Not very know. light fair. And then spoiler alert if you haven't seen it rude eyes and uh and so when that happened like i'm watching i'm kind of just kind of casually glancing up and it happened and i just caught myself getting all emotional in the bar Aww. with hip-hop playing just from the silent visuals <laughs> just because it was so emotionally affecting what was it like to be to kind of portray this character that has such a huge fan base as a uh, be part of something that has such a huge following and have so many people associate you with this particular really touching storyline um, I think it's just become a, an integral, just kind of normalized part of my life. Mm. Uh, I started getting used to it when I'd like walk down the street and I would just hear the do do do. do. <laughs> right. Like I'd look around, <laughs> like people love to mess with me with that for some reason. Um, no, but um, it, it was a really, really incredible experience. Just also because I was a huge, huge fan. Right. Like the biggest fan. I mean, when I was a kid, I read like every single young adult fantasy mm -hmm. uh, trilogy, every single young adult series. Hunger Games is my favorite. Mm -hmm. And so, even the third book. <laughs> <laughs> just, just asking. Even, even the third book. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it really was just like a surreal dream come true mm -hmm. from beginning to end. Nice. Uh, so you decided to take a break from film for a few years. Why? Um, like after that and like, oh after yeah. that mm -hmm. no that wasn't a decision um, oh. <laughs> no that was um, I mean I, it's it still is challenging to find roles mm -hmm. and, and uh, they didn't really exist I, I also wanted to finish school yeah um, so it was a combination of those roles not existing and me not wanting to force them because mm -hmm. I, I mean I wanted to finish middle school finish high school like do the regular gamut can you talk a little bit, I find it so interesting because a lot of actors talk about the difficulty of finding roles that move them, but they end up still doing other roles just so that they can stay working. Can you talk a little bit about making the decision that you weren't going to do roles that you didn't believe in from such a young age? I think that's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just am someone who also cannot fake it. Mm. Like I can only 
do something with my full heart invested or just not do it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I never wanted to, well, first of all, I mean, I'm, I was really young and I still am really young and I, it's, it's not a race, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had to be working all the time just to prove that I could work. I mean, I still have a lot of time to not act if I don't want to mm-hmm. and then do it later or take breaks because mm-hmm. um, you don't have to, to force your career to happen all at once, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I think that was kind of a part of it. Um, but also just I, I, I like to, to play characters that I believe in and that are three-dimensional and that I think are, are worth it. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't really want to have to diminish myself into something less nuanced or less authentic just because those roles don't normally exist for someone like me. Mm. That's great. And it's amazing that you know that even now or even then. That's really Thank amazing. You. Good good for you. Um, so after your break, I'm going to call it a break, <laughs> that's okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> or not working period, you did then do a film called As You Are. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it about this film that made you decide to return? Um, it was a or, script. Yes. It was the grungy aspect of it that I was really relating to in my earlier years of high school. Mm. The like um, '90s grunge scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The movie is like very. It's it's like there's a lot of teen angst in it, um, mm-hmm. and that was a concept that I felt very connected to uh, at 15, mm-hmm. 16. Um, and also the director, I was really interested by him because it was his first movie um, that he was directing out of out of school, mm-hmm. out of uh, college. And he just had such a, a beautiful view for it and wanted to work with me in a very collaborative nature. He was interested in fleshing out the character with me. Mm-hmm. The character was initially supposed to just be white. And then he thought that it would be much more interesting to, to make the movie more diverse. And so we actually explored the, the background of the character in terms of her being adopted mm-hmm. in this like, small um, town in, in, in mm-hmm. New York. Um, so yeah, it was, it was that, and, and it, it was also just the heart that I could tell was going to be in it from the mm-hmm. jump, and I feel like it, that really does come across. Yeah, oh, definitely. So. It's on Netflix, FYI, it, Canadian Netflix, it is on our Canadian Netflix, so you can, <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't have stuff, but we have as you are. Um, <laughs> our Netflix is not as great as yours. Um, <laughs> it's, it's getting better, that. getting better. Uh, was there... So I, I read some interviews where you talked about being hungry to see parts of your high school experience that you didn't always get to see on the screen. Were there things in this film that you, were able, you felt like you were able to bring that you hadn't seen before? Uh, in As You Are? Yeah, in As You Are. Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's like a, a real honesty to, to certain parts of it. There's a, there's a hand job scene. Um, but like an embarrassing, like the kid, like these kids are just experimenting with each other and like the parent walks in like, um, but it's all like, it's all very innocent. Um, <laughs> um, there's a, <laughs> there's, um, there's, um, I think just the, I think the relationships between the characters are really special because it's a, a, a very, um, a uh, unlabeled type of love mm-hmm. that exists with this, mm-hmm. this two boys and this girl, and they're all kind of experimenting with each other, and they all kind of date at one point, but it's a kind of unconditional love that isn't gay, isn't straight, it just is what it is. Right. Um, and so I think it was really special to be able to portray that. Mm-hmm. So we're going to show a clip of As You Are, but it's also going to come with a clip of the next movie we're going to talk about, which is Everything, Everything, directed by Canadian filmmaker Stella McGee. Shut up and listen. Excellent camera work, great sound and lighting, and even a good soundtrack that matches up with the action, the performers, especially Paris. Sizzle! The best home girl film I've ever seen. Brad Williams. What movie is that? Ghostbusters. Oh my god! Wait, when can we watch this? We are not going to watch this. You are a girl. This is a movie for men. (laughs) You guys aren't men. You're boys. You get, like, a boner after you see, like, a picture of, like, a single boner. That's just not even true. Yes, it's true. It's kind of true. (laughs) 
<laughs> like I have to deal with shit. I bleed. No. Oh, no, no, it's no, like a no, beautiful no, no. process. Fuck man, I can't shoot you. That's not a show. We don't talk about it. I don't want to hear about your bloody vagina. More Paris! Hey, are you trying to kill yourself? I've been doing gene therapy. What are you talking about? I don't want to tell you because I didn't want to get your hopes up. I mean, I don't want to get my hopes up. Gene therapy? I've been on a trial. Remember how I said that my type of skid was uncommon? Yeah. Well, I, I'm very common now. I can go wherever I want. <laughs> what, you, you're not sick anymore? That's what I'm trying to tell you. <sighs> no. I don't believe you. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Have I ever lied to you? No. So why would I start now? <sighs> look, if you're not sick, then, then why does it look like you're running away? Well, my mom is still worried. I know it's too good to be true. Just go back inside. No, Come on. Really, I have to know. Know what? I need to know if I'm still sick. And the only way that I'll know is if, if I'm outside. Can you come with me? Come with you where? Hawaii. Hawaii. I bought plane tickets. How? Credit cards are surprisingly easy to get. You're serious? <laughs> What's wrong with Southern California? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So you've had the opportunity to work on several projects directed and or written by black women like Stella McGee on Everything Everything, which is also an adaptation of a novel by the, with the same title by mm -hmm. Nicole Yoon, another black woman. Does it feel different when you get a chance to work on a material where black women are at the helm of it? 100%, yes. Tell me how. Um, it feels safe. Mm -hmm. It feels like um, I'm supported. It feels like I'm understood. It feels like I'm not being fetishized mm. or exploited in any way. Um, there are just things that, that I can relate to with those creators. And also, it's, it feels empowering. Mm. It feels really, really amazing to, like, me and Stella on Everything Everything kind of had this this feeling the whole time. We'd be like, we're infiltrating. <laughs> I'd be like, who let us do this? <laughs> like, that was kind of our mentality the whole time. Like, they don't even know yeah. what, what we're up to. Like, while, well, like, the white producers are just, like, sitting in the tent, like, <laughs> like ten What ten are they whispering away. about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, we, I mean, obviously, they let us make the movie. But, <laughs> but, like, we had this feeling of, like, they don't even know what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and things that we, like, would sneak into the movie. Or even just, like, having Maddie's hair be natural. Mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that we... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was something that um, was something that, that like we made that decision together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was also um, oh my god, why am I forgetting her name? The woman who played your mother, Anik uh, Anani Rose. Rose, also on set. So I'm sure that that creates a particular atmosphere on the yes. set as well too. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it for you to have mentors that are women of color? Do you have mentors in your life that that you go to? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. do you do you see yourself as somebody who? has a responsibility to mentor other women? Is that something you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I mentor I mentor people like my niece mm -hmm. um, or just like young black girls that are in my life that like I'm really close to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't feel qualified to do that had I not had people mentoring me like Solange. Like Solange is a really, um, really close friend of mine and like mm -hmm. someone who Anytime Officially I'm like, jealous, yeah. <laughs> anytime I'm like, girl, how do I navigate these white institutions? Mm -hmm. She's like, I got you. Like, here's the tea. Like, mm -hmm. be sneaky. I'm like, oh, okay. Can you talk a little bit more about that sneak, that infiltration? I mean, because you, you brought it up in a couple I'm of I'm not recent... being that sneaky if I'm being this vocal about it. But, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's an, an interesting idea. I mean, so just to go off on a little tangent, like uh, when I saw Atlanta, I felt like Donald Glover had like successfully infiltrated something, mm -hmm. like after years of kind of being, you know, the one black guy in community mm -hmm. or the one black guy in the writer's room of 30s rock, mm -hmm. 30 Rock or whatever, maybe was just like, hey guys, I have an idea for a show. 
And they're like, sure, Donald, mm -hmm. we love you. Go ahead. <laughs> this is in my head. This is the drop scenario. Bomb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he creates one of the most amazingly black TV shows mm -hmm. ever, mm -hmm. you know, and it just felt like a really successful sort of infiltration. So I'm just interested in this idea of infiltrating these spaces and what that looks like. You've talked a little bit about how you're sensibility is not really into like mainstream and pop, but you feel like it's important to get into those spaces. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that process and like why is it so important for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I just feel like there are certain people who are very, who have a lot of conviction about what type of work they want to make, what type of spaces they want to inhabit, are very against corporations. Um, but I, I feel like I've been put in this unique position where, where, where corporations feel like I have a, a mainstream appeal mm -hmm. and they're interested in working with me mm -hmm. and yet I can understand the other side or like I can see both sides like mm -hmm. Chanel. And so I feel like <laughs> it's kind of because I'm in that position, I feel like it's almost a responsibility of mine to utilize that in a way um, where we can like make uh, everything everything or... Mm -hmm. Or like, um, I worked on this film called The Darkest Minds, where mm -hmm. Ruby, who's the main character based on a book, is, I mean, she's not written white, but she's written white. Um, and, and, and like, they were interested in putting me in that role. Mm -hmm. And so when presented with the opportunity of doing something that is more mainstream, but like with a black girl, and then like other black girls get to see that, like, mm -hmm. we don't really have a young adult dystopian trilogy moment with people of color yeah. at the helm, you know? So it, it feels to me like if I can take those opportunities and take them mm -hmm. um, because of the potential doors that it can open for a lot of young actresses of color. Do they ever feel like a compromise in terms of the things that you're interested in? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, but it, it's it's a balance. You find the balance. Of it. I think it's like, like one, two for them, one for you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it. So I feel like in no, no matter what line of work you're in, you have to compromise and you have to play the game. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, but I feel like I'm actually able to maintain a balance, and I feel like the benefits that I reap even from working on like more more mainstream stuff, they're they're just amazing. Like they're incomparable. So I, I have really nothing to complain about when it comes to you know maybe putting aside my indie tendencies for mm -hmm. a more mainstream moment. You'll yeah. get back to the indie later. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so we're going to go back a little bit to 2015 when you decided to drop in the world this video called Don't Cash Crop My Cornrows. <laughs> um, so it was initially a high school assignment. Can you tell me mm -hmm. what was the initial assignment that yielded this viral YouTube video that you all should watch if you haven't seen it? Um, so uh, it was for my, my uh, modern U.S. history class in high school. And the assignment was to document the history of an artifact over the course of 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so people were doing stuff like the guitar or like the hammer or like stuff like that. And uh, my the friend hammer. and I... hammer? <laughs> okay. Like, like really random, just okay. like utilitarian objects and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> actually, like actually, I'm like, what? What is the history of the hammer? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but um, but my friend and I had the idea of doing cornrows just because we were very interested at that point in time. I think that was like, I don't know, 2015. Yeah, that's when it was. we were very interested in how, at that moment in particular, like black culture was being appropriated and was like erupting as mainstream culture, and how we saw all these people who had a lot of power. Um, and social influence adapting black culture and we're interested in exploring that so we kind of like didn't really follow the rules of the project we're like this is an artifact and we just we kind of followed cornrows over right. 10 years and then uh, showed it to my class my class was not feeling it oh no they were not they didn't like the video um, you better have gotten an A on that I did get an okay, A. Okay, good. I got an A. About but there to have there a were a lot of with your teacher. Well, I, <laughs> there were a lot of white white kids in my class who partook in black culture a lot and maybe kind of felt attacked by the video, which was not the point of it. Um, but anyway, so, so then like I think it wasn't until a few months later that I was like, oh, maybe I'll put this on Tumblr, and then people really reacted to it. So let's watch a clip from "Don't Cash Crop My Cornrows."
So black hair has always been an essential component of black culture. Black hair requires upkeep in order for it to grow and remain healthy. So black women have always done their hair. It's just a part of our identity. Braids, locks, twists, and cornrows, etc. Cornrows are a really functional way of keeping black textured hair unknotted and neat, but like with style. So you can see why hair is such a big part of hip hop and rap culture. These are styles of music which African American communities created in order to affirm our identities and our voices. In the early 2000s, you saw many R&B stars wearing cornrows, Alicia Keys, Beyonce, R. Kelly, and many more. As hip hop became more and more popular and integrated into pop culture, so did black culture. Eminem's album went four times platinum and he achieved immense success in the hip hop world. Black culture had become popular. As the early 2000s turned into the 2010s, white people began to wear clothing and accessories associated with hip hop. More and more celebrities could be seen wearing cornrows and braids and even grills. So by 2013, the fashion world had adopted cornrows as well. Cornrows and braids were seen on high fashion runways for brands like Marquesa and Alexander McQueen, and magazines had editorial campaigns featuring cornrows as a new urban hairstyle. And Riff Raff came onto the scene, a suburban white middle-class man who almost ironically took on a black scent and wore braids and gold teeth. And then James Franco took inspiration from Riff Raff for his role as Alien in Spring Breakers. And pop stars and icons adopted black culture as a way of being edgy and gaining attention. In 2013, Miley Cyrus twerks and uses black women as props. And then in 2014, in one of her videos called This Is How We Do, Katy Perry uses ebonics and hand gestures and eats watermelons while wearing cornrows before cutting inexplicably to a picture of Aretha Franklin. Uh-huh. I see you. So, as you can see, cultural appropriation was rampant. Not only were white people becoming rappers, but they were excelling in the world of hip-hop. Macklemore and Ryan Lewis's song Thrift Shop garnered a number one spot on Billboard's year-end chart for 2013, and then Iggy Zalea's song Fancy reached number one the following year. And in May of 2014, Forbes released an article titled Hip-Hop's Unlikely New Star, A White Blonde Australian Woman. But at the same time, police brutality against black people came to the forefront in an incredible movement ignited by the murders of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, and many others. People began to protest institutionalized racism by marching and by using social media. Celebrities spread awareness and shared condolences or at least some did, as Azealia Banks, a black female rapper, pointed out. As Azealia Banks observed in her tweets, white musicians who partook in hip-hop culture and adopted blackness, Iggy Azealia in particular, failed to speak on the racism that comes along with black identity. Banks and Azealia feuded on Twitter until Banks participated in an interview on New York's Hot 97. I have a problem when you're trying to, like, say that it's hip-hop and you're trying to, like, put it like up against black culture like it's like mm. a cultural smudging was what i see all it says to white kids is like oh yeah you're great you're amazing you can do whatever you put your mind to and it says to black kids you don't have shit. you don't own shit. not even the shit you created for yourself and it makes me upset that itself is what is so complicated when it comes to black culture i mean the line between cultural appropriation and cultural exchange is always going to be blurred but here's the thing appropriation occurs when a style leads to racist generalizations or stereotypes where it originated but is deemed as high fashion, cool, or funny when the privileged take it for themselves. Appropriation occurs when the appropriator is not aware of the deep significance of the culture that they are partaking in. Hip hop stems from a black struggle. It stems from jazz and blues, styles of music which African Americans created to retain humanity in the face of adversity, which itself stems from songs used during slavery to communicate and survive. On a smaller scale, but in a similar vein, braids and cornrows are not merely stylistic. They're necessary in order to keep black hair neat. <laughs> so I've been seeing this question a lot on social media, and I think it's really relevant. What would America be like if we loved black people as much as we love black culture? <laughs> have not, have not watched that in a long time either. <laughs> wow, this is like I'm being like taken on a tour through my own life. Like, <laughs> It's like your a &E biography behind the music. Kind of <laughs> um, so you decided to just kind of drop it on Tumblr. Did you have any idea the impact that it would have, that it would no. go viral in that way? What was that like, getting all those responses? Um, it was really cool. It was also really scary, mm -hmm. uh, just because 
I mean, I obviously did a lot of like in-depth research for the piece, but I could never have guessed that this history, this this video for my history class would then like start like an online feud between like not a real one, but like online feud to like me and Taylor Swift, like you know, just because mm. I dropped like a, a a clip of her in there, mm. like I wasn't necessarily trying to come for particular people, mm -hmm. but of course that's how press and media loves to skew things because it's more clickbaity. Yeah. Um, but no, I had no clue that I was going to even start any kind of, kind of conversation. And that was really gratifying, mm -hmm. just seeing that conversation kind of arise. And it's really interesting how, um, it's been really interesting to witness how it's gone from that point to where it's at now, where we like have such an extensive call-out culture. Mm -hmm. Not to say that I am in any way responsible for that <laughs> entire call-out culture, but just how we have this culture of, you're culturally appropriating, like yeah. you're canceled. You know, like it, it's it's like wild to see how how it's gone from a, a conversation starting here, and then mm -hmm. it's kind of gone to the extreme over there. And um, I don't know. I think it's it's important though that we actually do research and and check the credibility of things before we come for people. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. You can will. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's so interesting that you said that, uh, you know, when it came out, which is 2015, it's not that long ago, how much things have shifted. I was recently, I don't know why I did this to myself, but I never was one of those people that watched Glee when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, Glee would never have survived black Twitter. Like, this would not <laughs> no. have been possible. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, there's a lot of things that had came out before the rise of this culture where we can immediately respond to things and critically respond that uh, probably wouldn't have lasted as long as they did if, mm -hmm. if they existed in that time. Um, you, very soon after releasing this, you kind of entered this conversation and got this title of being an activist. And I know there are a lot of people who I consider activists that don't use the term. Is it some, a term that you personally identify with or is it something that has been placed on you? Um, I think a little bit of both. I mean, I think it's a, it was a word that was placed upon me and I kind of looked at it and was like, am I really taking this on? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. Just because I don't necessarily feel, I think there's all different types of activists. Um, and there are many activists who do much more critical grassroots work in a way that I don't. Um, but I do feel like I look at all of my work through the lens of activism and I do a lot of my work because I want to see things change. Um, and so in that way, I think I, I do claim mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You've talked a lot about the importance of recognizing the fluidity of identity. Um, I, would, I would assume that it's a bit of a challenge balancing that understanding for yourself and your understanding of identity with the reality of being a celebrity, because being a celebrity means kind of being branded a lot of the time mm -hmm. or being placed under categories by the outside world. Have mm -hmm. you found it challenging? Yeah, it's definitely been challenging at times. Well, I mean, it's just the being a teenager is literally just figuring out yourself. Um, so doing that on a public sphere, on a public level, has, has been really strange at times just because there have been moments where I have just been, you know, expressing myself or figuring myself out and people think it's some kind of political statement. And I'm like, nah, really, I actually like do like girls. Like, it's not, <laughs> right. I'm not trying to, yeah. um, like I am bisexual or I am like I, I'm exploring these different parts of my identity and it's in no way some sort of statement. It's mm -hmm. just like who I am. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Is there, um, I mean, okay, so I'll go through some of this sort of resume of things that have, have happened for you. There, Ms. Foundation named you its Feminist Celebrity of 2015. Time Magazine has named you a most influential teen more than once. Auntie Oprah tapped you to do a super soul session. Mm -hmm. And I read that Beyonce told you that when Blue grows up, she wants her to be just like you. All of these are incredible things. Um, yeah, like, seriously. <laughs> so every celebrity is subject to public scrutiny, but with the dual role of artist and activist, do you ever feel a certain pressure or standard that other celebrities who may be famous for just being famous don't have to deal with? Yeah, definitely. I think I'm, I'm held at a level of accountability, especially with the internet youths, um, mm -hmm. to never fuck up, mm -hmm. um, which is impossible. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I, I, I recognized that a long time ago that, oh, okay, so now I'm kind of being held as this like perfect uh, 
activist like angel who's gonna save everything and like I've never claimed to be that and like don't intend to be that I only just want to do whatever I can with the work that I'm doing and, um yeah that has been hard at times but but the thing is you just can't take it too seriously like you know I think it's really easy um because of the celebrity culture that we exist in to see celebrities as concepts and not people mm. um and so whenever people critique me on a public platform I think of it as work I think of it as oh they're critiquing the the idea that they have of me that they've gained through what they've seen online or what they've heard mm -hmm. um almost as if they're critiquing a, a, a piece of work or a piece of art that I'm molding as opposed to me as an individual mm -hmm. um, so I think creating that distinction has been helpful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and is that just like a personal distinction or is that something that you also try to convey like in your own platforms of things that you have control over? Um, I try to convey it, but at the same time, I, I feel like no one really needs to be in on that. Right. Um, you know, yeah. just because if, if um, there's like a black girl who feels empowered to wear her hair natural because they, she's seen a picture of me or follows me on Instagram or whatever, um, she doesn't need to know that like, there's a didn't think I have, to, I have to think about the dichotomy between like my public persona and my mm -hmm. personal stuff. Like that's my own thing to navigate. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's just a part of like being in the industry and having a platform. Mm -hmm. um, when Sterling K. Brown won an Emmy earlier this year, he made it a point to thank the writers for creating a role that wasn't just colorblind casting, which is cool, but a character that is specifically written as a black man. Mm -hmm. Um, you've spoken a little about intentional diversity. How much impact does that have on how you choose the projects that you choose? Um, it has all the impact just because the projects that I'm, I've been able to do wouldn't exist had, um, had, had there not been a movement pushing for it. Mm. Um, I feel like these like studios are really starting to recognize now, okay, we can't continue doing things the same way that we used to. Because now the kids have Twitter, and when they get on Twitter, <laughs> yeah. they can all collectively decide to not go see a movie because yeah. they don't stand it. Like yeah. it's really at that at that level, and so I think they're recognizing that they can't rely upon the same formulas to make money anymore. Not the same tokens. Yeah, not yeah. the same tokens, and that they actually have to diversify, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it'll affect them monetarily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we know diversity in Hollywood is a huge topic, but another related topic is colorism or shadism with some audiences noting that a lot of the roles that go to younger black women in Hollywood are frequently casting lighter skinned black mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the importance of taking up space within the context of this important conversation? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great question. That's something that I think about really critically. Um, one of the most challenging things for me to do was to walk away from uh, Black Panther. Because mm. I got really, really close, and then they're like, do you want to continue fighting for this? And I was like, this isn't right. Because <laughs> these are all dark-skinned actors um, playing like Africans. And I feel like it would have just been off to see me as a biracial American mm. like with a Nigerian accent, like mm. just pretending that I'm the same color as, some, as everyone else in the movie. Like, mm. You know, but that was that was really challenging um, to to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but I mean, I have no regrets about that. I I recognize one hundred percent that there are spaces that I do not, I should not take up. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. when I do take up a space, it's because I've thought really, really critically about it, mm -hmm. and I've consulted um, people I really trust, mm -hmm. and I've thought about it, and it feels right. Mm -hmm. um, that's, thank you for answering that because it's a yes. good one. Yeah. So, I mean, this is such an interesting cultural moment where it's actually like cool to be political. And I feel like, I, I mean, I'm not old, but I feel like uh, when I was your age, uh, which wasn't that recent, um, it wasn't cool to be political. And when I was doing activism, it wasn't cool to be an activist. And mm -hmm. all the people that I went to high school with and my friends and my homies, they were kind of like, what are you doing at this protest? And what do you like, why do you mm -hmm. keep asking me to sign this petition? And like, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't necessarily. So it's an interesting historical moment to exist within. Mm -hmm. um, and 
it's also a moment that corporations are capitalizing on and in very mm -hmm. interesting ways. How do you balance this consideration when brands and commercial media outlets approach you for various projects? That because right now it's cool to be political. Um, I think you can kind of tell immediately with like the wording mm. or just like how someone approaches or even just the, the history of that brand or that mm. corporation. I mean, of course, um, yeah, I mean, of course, it's hard to do research on everything, but, like, I feel like you can immediately tell someone's intention. Mm -hmm. If a brand comes to me and I notice that they are intentionally casting, like, black representation, gay representation, like, I'm like, okay, this seems a little <laughs> contrived, mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, it existing organically, right. you know? Um, it also has to do with, like, I, who's behind it, you know? Um, there have been even, like, sets that have been on where there's black people in the movie, but every single person on the other side is white. The producer is white. All the crew members are white. Those spaces don't feel safe for the people of color on set, you mm -hmm. know? So it, it really, I think, has to do with, like, are, if you're about this message, are you actually exercising it within all facets right. of, like, your corporation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Activism, because it's so fashionable right now, sometimes people forget that it's also a risky thing to choose to do. Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever feel like, do you ever feel that risk? Do you feel the, the things that maybe you have to sacrifice in the name of the activism or the things that um, you might have to give up because you've chosen to be political about something or the opportunities you've missed out on? Um, I don't know. I mean, the things, the opportunities, like, never really existed mm. so I didn't really feel like I had anything to lose um, and what's been the most bizarre kind of surreal thing to witness is how um, my being vocal has actually led to more opportunity mm. um, I think that is evidence of, of the time that we live in which is like you're saying it's cool to be politically active and to be vocal now mm -hmm. um, yeah mm -hmm. Um, I read that you've been making little videos since you were eight or nine on <laughs> iMovie. Is uh, being a creator an important part of your artistic expression? And if so, why? Yeah, 100%. Um, I just, I love film. I love being creative. I love being artistic. Um, and so whether that's like in, in the space of being an actor and being collaborative with the director mm -hmm. and the people I'm working with and and kind of asserting full kind of creative control, not full creative control, but but asserted, uh, asserting my, my creativity within constructing that character. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's like like making shorts, like I've been making shorts yeah, for a really long time, mm -hmm. like always took film class in school. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something I'm definitely going to continue doing. Mm -hmm. Working on some exciting stuff. Oh yeah? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Anything you can like, let us know a little bit about. Uh, <laughs> I'll just let you wait. Okay. <laughs> You'll figure out. You'll figure all right. It's all good. It's all good. Um, so you've had this incredible career where you've not only made films and acted in films, you've also written a comic book, you, uh, which is incredible. Um, I think I saw some t-shirts with your artistic designs on them as well, too, <laughs> that you, you did. Um, you've done a number of different things. Do you, have you ever felt or faced any pressure to zero in on one thing to the exclusion of the other things? Um, only kind of recently as I've been entering uh, the adult world have <laughs> I felt like that just because like pursuing a career takes all of your energy. And yeah. so I've noticed I've had to be much more decisive about where I put it. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like there's always a way to tie in like other creative outlets into whatever you're working on. Um, the music, so I almost forgot the music. You're also a musician as well, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. hopefully I, I will never have to choose one. You hope to continue your life always kind of exploring all the different elements of your creativity? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so you've been talking recently a lot about moving from talk to action. I, I saw that you've been working with Time's Up. Mm -hmm. There's the roles that you've chosen, the short films that you've made, the comic book you wrote, all of that can be seen as action mm -hmm. to help shape a radically inclusive future. If you had to describe, and this is an activity I used to do with the kids that I teach, um, describe the future that you actually are trying to build, like you are actually got to visualize it, what would it look like? Oh, man. Um, so often we're fighting against something, but we're not always sure what we're trying to build. Mm. 
I mean, I feel like the first most basic thing I feel like I, I'm looking for or trying to fight for is just safety for marginalized people. I feel like that's step number one because mm-hmm. we're definitely not there yet. And what does safety mean? Um, safety from violence, safety from racism in the many various forms it can take, safety from being um, reduced, mm-hmm. um, safety from police brutality, safety from feeling alien or other. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like that's kind of the first step. Um, and, and then I think maybe I'll be able to think past that. But mm-hmm. like right now I'm kind of focused on uh, us being seen as human. You know, I feel like that's why entertainment is really important to me. And film is really important to me. Um, not just because I love films, but because of the social power that it has and like the social capital that it has, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we're so obsessed with celebrities and movies and oftentimes they have a real power to influence our political decisions as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think having a black girl on screen um, can actually affect how white people in the Midwest who have never really given black women the time of day, mm. like maybe go see the movie and like actually start to see black girls as three dimensional. Mm-hmm. Or like the hate you give, for instance. Um, the fact that I, I got to work on that was like a real honor and, and it's a narrative about police brutality. Um, and, and to think about what it might be like for the community of the people who are killed by police, to, to see them human and to see them and their stories uh, fully represented, I think, can be powerful in making these issues feel real to everyone mm-hmm. instead of just feeling like another article and another post on Instagram. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. These are all thank my you. questions. Awesome. Uh, we are going to turn it over to the audience. I believe we have some mics that are going to circulate. Is that how it's going to work? Um, so you can raise your hand when you have a question and someone will come to you with the mic. Can you just try again? It might, they might have Hello. Out. They okay. Know. Hi. So my question is, sorry, I wrote it down. So traveling to Japan Dra- <laughs> traveling to Japan. I follow you on Instagram, by the way. I've been keeping up with everything. So, traveling to Japan, do you feel, oh my God, used without internet? <laughs> and just seeing the world just through Hollywood, and not just seeing the world through Hollywood's main construct of what film should be, do you feel the pressure in the industry to act a certain way as a young woman and like representing black people and like young black women and stuff like that? Like, do I feel a pressure to, to represent black girls in a certain way? Yeah, like, do you um, feel like, like, when you're when you're acting and, like, in Hollywood and just when you travel and stuff like that mm-hmm. and you see, like, other film and how they, they don't really, like, think about color and stuff like that, but acting in Hollywood and, like, getting jobs in Hollywood, do you feel, like, pressure from Hollywood to act a certain way and be a certain way rather than, like, you just traveling and seeing how other films work and stuff like that? Um, am I wording it? Am I wording it a little bit funny? Well, I just <laughs> no. It's a good question. I just can't tell. Okay. I, I feel like it's two questions, so I'm trying to figure out which one I should answer first. I don't know. Okay, I'll just go for it. Um, um, do I feel so? In answer to, do I feel that I have to represent black girls in a certain way? Um, ho- through Hollywood's eyes, in foreign places, or just. Uh-huh. Oh. Oh. Interesting. Um. I mean, uh, not necessarily. I feel like like racism, colorism is like universal. Um, no matter where you go, it exists. You know. So I, I'm not sure if, if I feel like I have to act some type of way in Hollywood and differently in you know other places. Um. But I do feel, I do feel a, a responsibility to like be cautious, you know, like to, like yeah, like have my fist, but like put it in my pocket sometimes, yeah. and, like keep it a little bit of like low key. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. 
Yeah, I think it's right over there, yeah. That's where I saw the light, yeah? Yep, I think it's on. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Hi, um, it's lovely to meet you. Um, you're very inspiring. Um, your music is amazing. Um, your cover of Mac Marco. I'm still waiting for a follow-up because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was great. And I want to know your inspiration you. behind how you wanted to like form that cover and like the unique sound of it and what else you have in the works. Mm. Word. Wait, sorry, what was the first part of that? It was how did I get to that sound? Yes. Okay, dope. Um, um, that cover was created with my friend Laven Cali. He's a producer. He lives in L.A. He's like, I think he's 20 years old. He's like a 20-year-old black kid. Um, and that actually kind of arose out of the blue. Like, I love music. I've been playing music forever. Um, my main instrument is the violin. I started playing it in elementary school. And so, like, the violins in that song are actually, it's like me playing. Mm -hmm. um, but we came up with that sound. I don't know, we just started grooving. Like, I just went, went to his house, like, came up with some chords. We started feeling it out together. But that was actually created because they wanted me to do a sound, uh, a song on the Everything Everything soundtrack. And they were like, we have this song that this pop producer wrote that we want you to sing. And it was like some pop ass. Like I was like, no, <laughs> this is not me. This will not be authentic to me. I'm sorry. And then they're like, well, what if you do a cover of a song that's on the soundtrack? And Let My Baby Stay was already on the soundtrack uh, because I really wanted it to be in the movie. Mm -hmm. I was like, guys, like, listen. Like, this song be perfect for the Hawaii bit. Like, trust me. And they actually really liked it. And like, Mac DeMarco was cool with it. And then um, they asked me to do a cover of the song. So that's how it started. Um, um, but yeah, but once we actually got into the studio and started working on it, like, it came very kind of naturally. I would love to continue working. I'm actually I'm working on some music stuff. But um, I feel like I still have to develop my voice a lot, uh, my style. But I'm working on that. Up top. Hello. Okay, so your Blue Girls Burn Fast short film that you did, do you plan on doing more stuff like that in the future? Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm actually working on directing some stuff right now. Um, thank you. That's the mysterious stuff that you're like, you'll I see. I know, I was like, you'll <laughs> see. I know, I feel like I'm not offering very concrete answers, but I am working on it. Yeah. Okay, right over here. Hi. Um, my name is Janelle. I'm a 19-year-old illustrator. Um, and my end goal is to make comics. And so in regards to Niobe, which you didn't mention was the first comic written by a black girl, illustrated by a <laughs> black girl starring a black girl, which... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, my question is not only what inspired you to write it, but like what pushed you? Because I'm inspired by a lot of things, but I never actually go and like actually make them. Yeah, um, Niobe actually kind of presented itself to me. Um, so Niobe is a character that already exists in this series um, called, and it's a stranger comic, it's called The Untamed. Um, and it's created by this biracial British dude who has created this entire world in his head called Asunda, which is the world that Niobe exists in. And he wanted to create a spin-off series about Niobe, but didn't feel qualified because it was not a black teenage girl to, to write for her. So then he actually approached me with the opportunity and was like, would you like to create your own comic book series? And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> sounds tight. Um, and we ended up working with Ashley Woods, who illustrated and everything. Um, yeah, so I, I think it was just a, a really a, a opportunity I could not pass up on. Um, and he gave me free reign to like exact out my wild fantasy dreams of like her like falling into waterfalls and like being like a badass, like killing people, <laughs> killing men who have like hurt like women, like <laughs> just like the craziest stuff. Yeah. How does that feel to see a comic that looks that's you, like, because she looks like you? Yeah, I know. As a badass warrior, kind of like it's really you know. wild because that wasn't uh, the intention at first. Mm -hmm. But then when we went into series two of it, um, that's just what what, she, what the artist wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was like, "Oh, 
I'd really uh, I'd really like to focus on like your features, like in different variant covers and stuff. People just because they know I'm working on it, we'll be like in the office together working on it and they'll be like, hey, can I just take a reference picture real quick? And so Niobe has slowly morphed into my face. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really awesome to see. It's cool. Definitely. It's um, I was up there. Yeah. Hi. So um, I feel like right now there's a very critical eye being put to feminism in terms of its racist past and its racist present, transphobia, like lack of intersectionality. So a lot of people are distancing themselves from the term. So how do you feel about identifying with the term in that context? Oh, interesting. Um, I don't feel the need to distance myself from the term. I think we just have to change the content, um, you know? I don't know <laughs> if I should elaborate on that further, but. I don't, I don't know if it's, to me, it doesn't feel necessary to disregard the term feminism in general. It's just about consciously working towards making it intersectional and inclusive. I also think it's like contributing to a long historical critique that's been going on by black feminists for a really long mm -hmm. time. So I feel Building like upon there's, a, something. Yeah, there's, a, there's a sense that it's new, but I think it's also been an ongoing critique that black feminists have been doing for, for decades now. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, just wanted to shout out the black feminism. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so my question is, is even though we're seeing a great change in Hollywood, um, there is a, a history of showing black people in subservient roles and tired and overplayed tropes. Mm -hmm. So how do you navigate an industry that can sometimes decide what black life looks like and that we can't live regular mundane lives like everybody else does. Um, so how do you navigate that and maybe get over the s frustration or do you feel, fr like how do you how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't take those roles. I think that's why I've, I've been having some little breaks here and there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I refuse to take a role that I feel like is detrimental to, or detrimental to dis demonstrating us in a way that is nuanced um, and like perpetuates tropes like that. I just have no interest in that. I'm tired mm -hmm. of that. Um, but I definitely have, of course, been frustrated for a while. That's, that's why it feels really special now that these roles are arising. Mm -hmm. Middle. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, it's great to meet you. Uh, nice I have. You. Like two questions. Mm. One's pretty easy, pretty chill. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, the next one's a little deep. Okay. So I'll ask the deep one first. Mm -hmm. um, being a black woman in the entertainment industry, um, I can understand that a lot of the time you'd probably be told, you know, what, not necessarily what to do, but you're given a lot of limitations in terms of like what you can choose, your career. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to ask, how do you, if you feel like you, like how do you either plan on getting to the place where you are the shot caller, where you can, um, where you can make, I guess, uh, where you have like a bigger influence in regards to your career mm -hmm. or in regards to what is put out to the public? Mm -hmm. um, or if you feel like you've gotten there, like how do you, how um, did you get there? Uh, just like as an example, it's, you know, Zendaya putting out her TV show. I don't remember what it's called. I'm gonna be honest with you, but like, Casey what is Undercover. It? Casey Undercover. Casey Undercover. <laughs> yeah, like stuff like that. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, but putting out shows like Casey Undercover, um, that, that just like an exit example, I guess. Um, or even just like you saying in like how in your movie, in the movie that you were in, you um, asked for a Mark, Mac DeMarco song to be in a scene. So just like, how did you get there and, or if you are there and how do you plan on getting there? And when you do get there, if you are not yet <laughs> in your mm -hmm. mind, mm -hmm. what are you going to do with it? Or what do you plan to do with it? Um, second question, a lot more chill. <laughs> okay. What are you bumping nowadays? Like what oh. songs are you listening to? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, let me just recensor. Um, I do feel like to a, a degree I have reached that point where I'm able to put my foot. I'm like, 
you prefer the hate you give. Um, I was very involved in the casting process. I was very, very uh, stubborn <laughs> during shooting about maintaining aspects of the book and the heart of the book and and elements of of the Black Lives Matter movement that reflect reality, making sure that we don't in any way commercialize that or or make it less impactful or or, let, or easier to watch just because like it's commercialized. Like, um, I think it can be detrimental sometimes. That's why I have to be careful. Um, <laughs> um, I think I, 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 I do have to be cautious about how, how very obviously local I am. And I think there's, you know, there's other ways to do it as well. Um, I think some of the best, uh, or most influential women of color, like in entertainment, have done a really great job of building at it over time and being patient and biding their time and mm. plotting, <laughs> you know? Beyonce. And so, Beyonce, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like, um, I think I, I have to, in, in many ways reached a point where I feel like my creative voice is actually really valued by the people that I work with. And so I'm really grateful for that, but definitely have places to go. Like definitely, definitely lots of things I want to make and produce and stuff. But I haven't reached that point yet where I'm, I feel ready to do that. Um, but I think I'm, I'm on my way there. And I think it, it's just yeah, a lot of patience and staying true to what you believe in, staying true to the path, the vision, not letting other things distract you. Um, and then one of my bumpers, <laughs> um, you said SZA. <laughs> of course, I mean, who is not, of course I'm listening to Control. Um, what else am I listening to? Like, oh no, I don't have my phone on me. Damn. Um, I love No Name. I love No Name. She's amazing. I want to get her in the movie. Um, <laughs> uh, I love, um, I mean, the Black Panther album is obviously so lit. It's so good. Um, I love that song, Khalid and Slate. Is it Khalid or yeah. Khalid? I, I think Khalid. Khalid. Yeah. Oh, and I'm off. Yeah. And Sway Lee. Yeah. That song is lit. I love that song. Uh, yeah. Bumpy. Sorry, I forgot that I was supposed to ask you about Lemonade, and I would be remiss if I didn't. Okay. Um, what was that like? Like, being on that set, what was the energy of that like? It was, well, first of all, it was like, I was like, oh my God, like, I'm a part of the FBI now. Because it was so, <laughs> it was so, like, locked down, like, could not tell anyone, I could not mm. tell my best friend, who is the biggest Beyonce fan on the planet, I could not tell her where I was going, what I was doing. <laughs> what? She said the betrayal, Judas. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> um yeah, no, I could. So that was like really challenging to keep to myself. I was like, people are like, where are you going? I'm just going to New Orleans for, I'm um, going to visit some family. And then so I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, just freaking out. Um, we shot it on a slave plantation, um, on a former slave plantation. And so there was something really beautiful and like powerful about the experience of like reclaiming mm -hmm. that land and, and shooting there and, and like kind of just bathing the entire space with the energy of like reclamation, mm. like knowing that was like a group of black women coming together to make a really important piece of art, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was really amazing. Um, me and Zendaya were up in this tree <laughs> and we had to pee so bad, <laughs> like so bad, like, and we were both just like, only for Beyonce. <laughs> like, so like, whenever I see that shot, we're in the tree. Like we're like, like look really serious. Like we're really just not, trying not to pee <laughs> because that that it was high up in the air. We did you know it like, was gonna be the huge cultural impact that it was? Like, did you know? Like, did you feel that while you were on set? Um, Sorry, I will get back to you. I just know that I had to ask about lemonade. I promise I will get back to you guys. Well, we didn't even know what it was when mm. we were there. We were not told what it was. We're not told the name. Mm -hmm. We're not told if it was one music video or an entire visual album. Hmm. We started to piece together, obviously, while we were there, but it was like the only the information that was needed 
yeah. was was told. That was the only way you can Beyonce can make things. I'm, I'm That's guessing. yeah. I interviewed Hannah yeah. Beachley, the production designer. She said the same thing. She's like, yeah. I didn't even know what I was doing. Yeah, like, I was. I was just like, just, where you want me? <laughs> yeah. Whatever, I'll do it. You want yeah. me in the tree? Yeah. Good. Like, yeah. I'm like I had no questions. <laughs> um, yeah, it was beautiful though. Um, it was directed by Khalil Joseph, mm-hmm. who is a very dear friend of mine now, and was just like. My favorite director it's brilliant. of all time. He's brilliant, and so he was really just about creating the actual organic um, realities, and then just filming them. So he, so there's a lot you don't actually see, but he would put like four girls in the kitchen and just say, "Start making something," mm-hmm. and then he'd put two girls out in like the field and be like, "Just play, like do whatever you want." And put some girls in another like in a farm area. And have us like organically actually doing these motions. We wouldn't know when the camera would come around, and then all of a sudden, like the ca- the cameraman would just be walking through with the camera mm. and capturing what was already organically happening. Mm. So he was very much about like creating that that beauty, like from like all the way through. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I pray for that director's cut, that director's commentary. Where are we going? Right over here. Oh. I can't, I can't. Talk. You got all the exclusives. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, so thank you for being here and thank you both for this conversation. Um, we've talked kind of about a lot of big things and my, my question is actually a little bit more granular. I'm always so curious to know and to hear about what very high functioning, super creative people do in their day to day, like what your routines are like, what habits you've cultivated to create on such a sort of incredible way thank you um oh man it really depends what i'm what i'm doing because i've been working um pretty back to back for the past like year um so only recently have i actually been home just chilling um play with my cat a lot my cat is like the biggest source of therapy that and I did not know that was like I was like, Oh, I think I'm gonna get a cat. Like I wanted to get a cat for my whole life. My cat like has changed my life. Mm. Like I love it. <laughs> Just talking about my cat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um what do I do for myself? I like love to set aside time to read, to research, because everyone like if there's anything I have a question about, someone has written about it at some point in time. Like, all the answers already exist. We're just kind of recycling them now, <laughs> you know? Um, so, like, that. I also um, have a central oil diffuser. That's, like, my best friend. Um, yeah, I just chill at my house a lot when I'm home. And when I'm working, I'm on a full work schedule. So I don't really have time to do that much besides like, focus on that character and get as deep into that character as I can. Hi, Mandela. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, you are a part of the Time of Death movement, and I just want to know, um, how do you think it will benefit men and women, um, not just in the entertainment industry, but like uh, women, men and women across all workplaces? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, I think, I think in, in very concrete ways and also in more long-term ways, um, I mean, the things when you address sexism, when you address assault, when you address rape, it's not like sexism only affects women, you know? I mean, it's it's the stereotypes and the constructs that we have around gender that force us to be put in positions that hurt. It hurts everyone, you know? And so I feel like in undoing um, or at least addressing a lot of a lot of the violence towards women, we're also addressing violence towards men. It's been really important, especially recently within like the meetings, to actually have a very constructive conversation about how we include men in the movement, whether that's through male a- allies and and having them use their voices, um, or how we address assault and and violence towards men. Um, and so I think like as the movement continues, you'll see like how that influences like how people are speaking about it. Um, and also the whole beginning of Time's Up was to raise money for the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which is all that, all that money is being utilized for workers. I cannot tell you exactly how because they have people 
who are in charge of that, who like <laughs> are very skilled and, and like trained at like utilizing those resources for different organizations and placing in different ways. But it all started because of the of the letter that was written by the campesinos. You know, I don't know if you know about that. So okay, so the the Times Up movement started um, because there was a, a letter written to the women of Hollywood mm -hmm. from these farm workers, um, basically saying, we need your help. Um, we are c continuously exploited and maltreated in our environments, and we, we feel like you have the voice and the power to be able to do something about it. So a lot of the uh, initial times of um, campaigning has been to raise money for um, a legal defense fund that's going to be utilized for those workers and utilized in all sorts of industries. Um, but I cannot tell you literally exactly how, but <laughs> that is the, what the work is all heading towards. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd like to start off by saying thank you to both of you, to Amanda and Amandla for being here, because I don't think we thank black women enough. Um, yeah. Um, also, side note, in case you were wondering, I was the person who was ululating in the crowd when you came out. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, okay <laughs> right there you here. are, sorry. Yeah, we, you heard the <laughs> because <laughs> I'm a Southern, unapologetically Southern African from the kingdom of Lesotho, so to hear like a word like Amandla, mm -hmm. which is in Zulu and Kosa, like that's amazing to me, so <laughs> that was me being rowdy. But um, <laughs> my question is, do you sometimes feel as though people value your work more or less because of your age, or are you afraid that your work will be viewed differently, differently because of your age, especially as a young person? Um, if so, how do you work around that? And if not, how do you overlook people's expectations of young people producing good quality work, and do you feel like, well, race and gender play a role, like play into that a little bit of how people value your work? Because I definitely mm -hmm. see it. I'm a young creator mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. and people will approach me like, oh, but you're so young, and that's amazing that mm -hmm. you're doing these things. But I'm like, is it amazing because it's amazing, or is it amazing because um, yeah. you're not expecting a young black queer mm -hmm. immigrant woman to be doing this work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, no, I, I definitely pick up on when I'm in, like, a meeting with, like, an old white dude, and I come through with, like, full just, like, opinions, like, viewpoints, plans, and I can tell immediately that they're invalidated before, like, they're given the full chance, you know? So I, like, definitely think that I'm affected by that. Um, but I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily let that stop me just because I think the proof is always in the pudding. Like, I feel like as you continue to make work, the people cannot deny whether it's good or, you know. Um, but one thing I do sometimes think about is I almost don't want people to take me too seriously right now. Because I think it's really easy when you're young to be like, I want to be the best. I want to be doing all this. I want to be like, I want to be everything, you know. And I feel like you can almost jump the gun. Like you have to give yourself space and time to also just learn and grow. Um, and if anything, I, I hope not to just be um, categorized or I hope not that my, the perception of me only relies on the perception of me as like a young artist. Like I hope to continue growing um, and to grow bigger and, and to expand and, and not just be kind of limited to the work that I make when I'm younger. Mm -hmm. So I almost like, sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, like I'm glad that you enjoy my work, but like take it with a grain of salt because like I'm still figuring it out, you know? Um, I don't know if that really answers. Okay. <laughs> Hello, how are you doing today? You guys are doing well? Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm gonna calm down, sorry. Um, I'm very thankful and very appreciative to have you in this space, sharing your wise words. I'm very, very appreciative of that. Um, I just wanna say, let my baby stay. It was like on repeat for like maybe 30, 40, 50 times. Just saying. Um, That's also, so wild to me, because I don't know people were really it's very good. rocking like, with it. Thank man. you. <laughs> sorry, um, I'm gonna drive that, I'm gonna drive that. And I had shed a um, multiple tears when Rue died, just saying, I don't know if anybody else felt that way, but when Rue died, I'm like, damn, they got to take the blunt person like that. What? <laughs> but I'm going to drop back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but you had spoken about um, the fact that you're, you're navigating your identity in like such a very, like where everyone's kind of watching you. 
Um, and I remember like a little while back, you had spoke on your um, they and them pronouns and not changing them, I think, on your Wikipedia page or on mm-hmm. your IMD page. Mm-hmm. But I was wondering for the youth that are within this society, um, how would you explain to them that it's okay to kind of figure yourself out and navigate your identity in the way that you want to mm-hmm. rather than the way that people tell you how it should be kind of um, thing? I mean, I think you are telling them right now. I think you just said it in your question. But but definitely, um, yeah, so the background behind that was on Tumblr and <laughs> Tumblr. And um, <laughs> I was like, I, I I I feel like my gender is very fluid and like I have moments where I wanna be on like my full boy shit and then I'll have other moments where I feel really feminine and like it oscillates a lot. Um and someone had asked me a question on Tumblr, they're like, Oh, what do you identify with in terms of gender? And I was like, Well, if I really think about it probably non binary and they were like, oh, Okay, well do you want us to use they them pronouns? And I was like, you know what, on Tumblr that would be tight. Like, let me see how that makes me feel. And then I put that out, and everyone was like, oh, my God, not binary icon. And then they went on my Wikipedia and all my, like, public platforms and changed all my pronouns. And I was like, wait, I don't even know if I'm feeling this yet. Um, and so that's why I told I told people to not do that. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's this idea that, like, you have to find this, this final form idea of who you are and exactly how you want to be represented and and if you don't fight for that then you're not being the martyr that you should be um I don't necessarily feel a responsibility to always be a martyr anymore like I think at one point I kind of felt that like it was my responsibility to if to be very vocal about every single part of my identity because of representation I still think that's really important and like I'm there for the people who like feel represented by me like and I'm there to talk to them and and like make them feel less alone but I don't I don't feel the responsibility to go into like a room with like older corporate people who don't understand that concept at all and be like nah you need to call me they them because it'll just like (laughs) you know it's actually almost deconstructed at this point in time. And I think we're heading to a place where like, it will be much easier to have conversations around gender. And I feel very safe uh, being openly about non-binary in, in spaces that make me feel safe to be that way, mm-hmm. you know? But at the same time, it can almost be, it can also make me feel less safe to have to fight for um, a, a word, you know? And, and I'm comfortable just doing me I don't know you know so I feel like it's not necessary to have to like always make a, a political statement out of your identity like I think especially with the internet now like those concepts kind of go hand in hand but I don't think that's always necessary you know yeah okay. <laughs> hi Amanda La. um my name is Vaidehi and I'm a 19 year old aspiring actor as well so Having the opportunity to see people like you doing such good work in the industry is a real inspiration. Um, On a more personal note, as someone within the entertainment industry, you are obviously at the forefront of a lot of conversation, and that comes with a lot of criticism as well, sometimes uncalled for, sometimes unasked for. And with mental health awareness growing these days, and as someone who might be facing a lot of criticism because of your popularity, what is your zen and how do you deal with maintaining a sense of balance in a world where it's so easy to cloud your mind with such chaos? Okay, the delivery of that question was amazing. And I just have to... <laughs> it's like a news reporter clarity, like, to that. Um, well, I think it's, like, I think it's all thinking about it in context. Um, I think it's very easy at this age to feel like whatever is right in front of you is everything and it's always gonna be that um, and that's just not true. So I think like uh, putting things in perspective is what, I, what helps me a lot, like what I was saying, um, just knowing that 
when I receive criticism, it's, it's not people don't know me. <laughs> they think that they know me, but they actually know a concept of me. And so that concept is actually what is being, um, yeah, what is being criticized as opposed to my soul, myself, you know. Um, and just knowing that, like, life is much, much bigger, much longer than whatever you're facing in the moment um, is, is really helpful to me. I have to remind myself often that I have a lot of time. A lot of time. Like, I don't have to be perfect at everything now. I'm definitely learning. Yeah. We have time for one more question. It's up there. Hi, um, my name is Thunder. Um, hey. You're a multifaceted artist, as I've been learning. I, I am too. And I, would just, I was just curious on how you navigate the multiple different art forms that you have at your disposal, like your multiple disciplines and, and mediums. How do you manage being active in all of them? Um, I just like, I just get bored. Uh, <laughs> and like I, I like am very lucky that I uh, have a tendency to just be more productive when I'm like, pro like creatively productive when I'm bored um, yeah so I kind of just I, I never like force myself to do anything like whenever I have a creative urge to do something I'll go for it you just mean like navigating like time wise or Right, I honestly feel like that's something I could work on is because I'm, I'm not consistently active in every single art form, though. Like, I, I feel like I do dabble in a lot of things, but I could really, like, hone my, my talent with different things. Um, but I, I'm constantly in the process of, like, like, now I'm learning, like, oh, it's actually necessary to, like, schedule your time. Like, okay, so on that day, I'm going to work on that. And then, like, for that two weeks, I'm going to go focus on that. Like, I'm, I'm learning that skill. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also like a passion thing, you know. Yeah. So that concludes this part of the conversation. We're going to end actually with a piece that Amanda made called You Are Here. It's a video on self care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to get up and do some of the things that she recommends, you're, you can totally oh do that. <laughs> because it has step by step instructions. Uh. Kind of goes to the question <laughs> above about how do you find your Zen. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us in this conversation, Amanda. Thank it's been you. so awesome to talk to you. Yeah, this was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, and this conversation is going to go online, so make sure to check out TIFF, and they'll be releasing the video as well, too. Um, and if you're part of the festival, have an awesome time. It's a great festival. And check out You Are Here. Hi, this is Amanda Senberg, and this is to help you slow down and feel a little bit more present. Place your feet firmly on the ground. Feel it steady beneath you. You are tethered to the earth. Now pay attention to your body. Focus on what it feels like if you stroke your tongue against the roof of your mouth. Try running your fingertips along the inside of your arms and your wrists. Now place your hands in front of you. Clasp them together. Place them on your head and pull down. Focus on the raising of your body air, the way that your lungs feel as they fill with air, the goosebumps, the sweat from each pore, all of the little functions that work together to make up the resilient being that is you. Make your back as straight as you can. Your feet are still roots in the ground. But now there's this silver wire connecting you from your crown to the sky. Now breathe in 